people to not be able to meet the uh, low income situation that they're in when they're on income assistance. And uh, for people with any unexpected issues that could emerge, you will blow your budget. It's simply not dignified to have to live that way. It's not okay to shut yourself out from friends and other people to not be able to uh, go out and engage with them. It's not okay to feel that you're dizzy and weak uh, and low in energy all the time. It's not okay to think that you can't have and afford medication when you become ill. It's not okay if your child is living in that situation. And yet that's the reality for many, many people. So I want to say thank you to the uh, Welfare Food Challenge organizers for bringing us together to keep on top of this, to call on Premier Christy Clark to raise the rates. We can do this, we can afford to do it, and we must do it. And on the national level, I want the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, to bring forward a national strategy to end poverty. And in the House of Commons, my colleagues uh, has actually taken a public members bill to call for a national strategy to end poverty, to ensure that we have a commissioner who will come forward to say that and make sure that we stay on target. And finally, to include social inclusion as part of that strategy. So I want to thank you uh, for all of this. And um, I have to leave soon because I have to go to the airport to catch my flight to Ottawa. So thank you so much. I'm Paul Taylor. I'm the Executive Director at Gordon Neighborhood House. Uh, and I'm here with Derek Kent. Derek Kent is the Executive Director of the City Community Foundation. We're going to be your co-moderators, co-chairs uh, today. Um, thank you everyone for coming. So we're just going to run through a few logistics. Uh, uh, logistics. There is a video being made, as you can see. If anyone would not like to be filmed, uh, just at any point, um, go up and, and give uh, a little tap and just let, let it be known that you wouldn't like to be filmed. Um, this video is being made possible thanks to Van City. Thank you to Van City Community Foundation and the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition for funding the making of this video to capture uh, this experience and, and today's event. Uh, we also want to note that we invited, uh, raised the rates, invited all of the MLAs in this province to participate in the Welfare Food Challenge. Um, only two accepted the challenge. The first time for, for this challenge, and we have two sitting MLAs um, doing this challenge, both uh, Spencer Chandra Herbert and uh, Melanie Martin. So we appreciate uh, both of you doing that. Also, we've got some action happening back here. We've got Drawing Change. It's a graphic recording. We have Tiara here. She's going to tell us a little bit more about what, what will be happening behind us. Hello. Uh, my name is Tiara. I'm a graphic recorder with the agency Drawing Change. And my role here today will be to listen to the questions and the conversations generated from the Welfare Food Challenge and make a visual reflection of the conversation um, so, capturing big ideas, some of the highlights, and I'm really looking forward to listening to the conversations that emerge from the panel. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Kiari. Um, <coughs> just a couple of the logistics things I'm supposed to let you know where the can is. So the, the washroom, is, there are single stalls here, and then larger washrooms out there. Um, again, I want to offer a profound thanks to the City of Vancouver for offering up this venue. Um, and uh, to raise the rates, particularly for the, the hard work, I, I'll point out again, Bill, but, but the tireless efforts to go into all this organizing and to bring you all here and, and amplify the voices that each of us have individually into something much louder together. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, the other, the last thing, uh, just before we get kick, uh, kick start the whole thing, is we're, we're hoping that maybe at the end we might be able to take a, a photograph of as many of you as, as can stick around. Uh, we were thinking maybe come up to the front here and we could get a shot from up there with the, the graphic representation in the back. But if, if you have time at the end, we'd love to get a picture with a, a large group again to communicate the momentum and, and the number of people who are behind this issue. We're through the logistics. Okay. Um, um, I, um, like I said, I work at Gordon Neighborhood House. See one of my colleagues here. I hope you don't mind me pointing you out. Susanna Miller back there. Um, Susanna also participated in the Welfare Food Challenge this year. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, I chose not to. 
Um, I did it, I think it was four or five years ago when we first did the welfare food challenge. Um, but I also grew up poor, so doing this challenge was very, very triggering for me and reminded me of those experiences. And for my mental health, I had to stop. So I chose not to do it since then, but I really appreciate all of those folks like yourselves who participated in the challenge to really impress upon how important it is that we must end poverty in this province and we must raise the rates. So thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, so my name is Derek Jeff. I'm the executive director of the Van City Community Foundation. Um, and, and I did participate in the challenge this year. I first did it two years ago uh, with my whole family, uh, including three young kids. Uh, and that was a real eye-opener and, and, and drove a lot of personal passion around just how ridiculously inadequate uh, the rates are. And, and it was really interesting to watch them go through it and engage in conversations with their friends and, and bring awareness like at those early levels, we, we need a whole sort of paradigm shift, a cultural shift to understand what people are going through and to build awareness uh, about this particular issue. Um, so I, I offer also my thanks to all of those of you who are participating in this and, and those who are, who are living this reality day to day and still find the energy to engage in the kind of activism and advocacy um, with such fervor, and, and I'm so inspired and, and learned so much from, from the folks from Raise the Rates and that are doing this work uh, day in and day out. Uh, I hope this is a bit of a, a validation and a moment of, of collective movement building that, that we can gather from. And the last thing I'll sort of lay as context, because this is something I've been reflecting on, and, and I hope our institution uh, at Van City is also reflecting on, is, is a quote from, from Nelson Mandela, actually, and I know Trish from the Poverty Reduction Coalition, who's, who's just joined us recently at the foundation, puts it at the end of all of her emails, is the idea that overcoming poverty is not an act of charity. In, in fact, it's an act of justice. And, and the extent to which we get into that mindset, away from food banks and shelters and, and, and patchwork solutions into <coughs> good public policy and changing the way that we think about this. I, I, the other quote I'll, that we'll hear a, a number of times today that I reflect on from Bill is that poverty is a political decision. And we can choose as representatives in that political process to ask for change. And I think that's probably the biggest takeaway from today and, and what you'll hear from the panelists and what we're going to as we move into action be pushing for is to demand that change uh, as a society. So, all right. Let's get into it. All right, I'm going to start with introducing our panelists. Um, so when I say your name, if you can just give us a wave. Um, Andrea Reimer, Vancouver City Councilor. Fraser Stewart with Raise the Rates and the Carnegie Community Action Project. One of my heroes. Irene <laughs> Lanzinger, uh, President of the BC Federation of Labor. We've got Fraser Doak with Raise the Rates and Positive Living in BC. Um, Caitlin Segelko, a uh, Strathcona resident. Uh, Lillian Lin, a, a registered dietitian, and Spencer Chandra Herbert, MLA for Vancouver West End. Excellent. All right, let's start just before we kick off. Like one more logistic thing that I thank you profusely. I grabbed Wes when he came in. If folks don't know Wes Regan from the city of Vancouver, uh, he has kindly agreed to be our timekeeper because the biggest challenge we have up here is going to be keeping this in a time frame to get out of here. So the, the, the respondents have been asked to limit your comments to three minutes. Wes is going to raise a card when you have a minute left, and then raise the magic X when you are done. And we will help enforce that from here. So nice one. Awesome. How we can get Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Um, we're going to start with our first question. Uh, what was your experience taking the challenge, or what's your experience living on welfare, and how did it make you feel, or how does it make you feel? Who would like to start us off? Maybe we'll go around. Andrea? Um, I was reluctant to go first, and I felt like I, I already went first. Um, so I did want to point out, um, we've had four of us from the community taking the challenge that I know of, um, and all of us are here today. So Molly Henry, who is, works in the mayor's office, is up in the balcony. Um, and then Wes Regan, who you just met as our timekeeper, as well as Mary Claire Zach, who is the head of our social policy. Um, I will say, speaking personally um, to the first question about the experience, 
Um, I spent 10 years, um, six years on the street and four years living in fairly, most of my time on the street I was too young to get welfare, um, so it was a very different experience. Been a year on welfare and then three years as a desperately poor working person. Um, so I thought I would have an advantage. Um, as my friends know, I like to win things, and I know the point of this is not to win, but I thought I would have an advantage um, on the challenge. Um, but it turned out I didn't read the fine print, um, and this prohibition on free food, forest food, town food, friends food, um, really put a cramp in my um, previous style, which made me realize how, it was such a stark moment of realizing how much um, the fact that I, I mean, I just genetically am extroverted, I was born extroverted, um, a huge advantage um, if you are living poor, because you, you know, there's long lineups, um, just to survive in those lineups um, without getting pushed out is challenging, but to, to make the connections you need, to find the friend networks, to share the food, to figure out where to guard, like all the, the resources are wasted. Um, and I'm also pretty physically, have always been you know, fairly athletic, so that helps. I can walk long distances. Um, I was a vegetarian when I was living on the streets. I used to walk all the way up to the temple and like, down through Broadway um, to eat um, to eat Sikh food. That's where I learned about the Sikh religion and how generous it is. Um, but it was a really good moment of realizing that um, it's not just about not living in Vancouver and not having access to food banks and other things, which is the reason the world exists. Um, but also understanding that, you know, if you have any barriers at all, this becomes impossible. Um, I also had to travel on Thursday and Friday for work, which I knew going into it. Um, I lived many years without any cooking facilities. It was pretty startling how much that impacted my food. Um, I, I was a bit shocked by it. Um, and I would, I, I was glad to hear your comments, Paul, because it did. It triggered a lot for me, I, and I found when I ran into people from my street involved life, how much trauma we built up, and how it feels weird to say that. Well, there's people here who are still living in that world because it you just got to keep going so you don't have time to process it. But um, it's still there 25 years later. Thank you, Andrea. I really want to talk. Yes. Um, well, I first want to acknowledge that uh, there were three uh, leaders of unions, and well, three officers of the BC Federation of Labor who took the challenge. Um, Glenn Hansman, the president of the BC Teachers Federation, who's here. Uh, Victor Elkins, the president of the Hospital Employees Union, who I think just about does it every year, or tries, and uh, me. Um, this is the second time I did the challenge. I did it two years ago, uh, and the amount of money then was $21, not $18. And one of the first things that really struck me was the difference that $3 made to me. I mean, $21 is not enough, let's be clear about that, uh, but $18 is a lot less. Uh, it's a really a 15% uh, reduction, pretty close to in the amount of money you had. So um, I have never lived in poverty. Uh, when my family immigrated to Canada, we were four children and we lived in a one-bedroom house, so we haven't always been rich, but uh, we have always had food. I don't ever remember not having enough food as a child or ever in my life. Uh, so for me, I, I live in a tremendously privileged life and uh, I, I do this uh, my tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of solidarity uh, with the people who do it every week. Um, I find that I just, it's just the amount of energy you have to spend planning around food and thinking about food and calculating how much you have and dividing up how much you have to last the week and going hungry and I also traveled to Edmonton and back and ended up at the end of the meeting I was at at a reception with food and open bar and you know it's it's you know these these are my daily experiences I'm around food all the time I like to say sometimes I could live on the food that I get at meetings and receptions alone um, so, you know, but that sort of speaks to the social isolation, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more in the, in the second question. But one of the experiences I had was on the first day when I came home Saturday, I went and bought my groceries. I buy, spent the whole $18 on the first day and planned the week. And I dropped an apple and it got bruised. And I was so upset about dropping that apple because I only had two apples and I had bruised one of them. And so this is just, it just really brought home to me how, how this struggle of like little bits of food is an everyday reality for 185,000 people and more because people who work in living poverty have some of the same struggles. Thank you, Irene. Uh, 
Spencer. Uh, I guess um, what I was really struck with was how precarious it is, how vulnerable you are, uh, how anxious it can be to know that, did I plan correctly? Um, uh, my husband and I did it together and put our table, our food for the week up on the counter. And um, some nights, it really felt like I wanted to eat all that was left for the week. Um, because only then could I be full. And to know that if I did that, there would be nothing left for days. Uh, so knowing, no, when you go to bed hungry, you wake up hungry. And now many constituents, and I want to thank Fraser Doak and uh, others uh, who encouraged me to do the challenge, have told me about this, and we've certainly seen it. And I see it a lot when I talk to constituents, and not just on social assistance, but also disability. Uh, also working minimum wage, also working for more than minimum wage, but in very precarious work that's very part time. And so to live just for a moment, uh, and just to imagine this, and to live just in a moment while walking down the street and looking at restaurants which um, you can't get lunch for more than 18, for less than $18, which would be your entire budget, um, that's pretty crushing. Um, and I think uh, on Friday I had to go in for some dental surgery. And so that made the rest of the challenge in some ways easier because it was challenging to eat and there wasn't much left to eat, but even harder because my body had undergone surgery. And it made me think a lot about people who would never have a dental plan, uh, can never get dentistry. And the time when the BC government said to folks living on assistance, well, we will fund the upper denture, but if you've lost your teeth, you can only get an upper denture or you can get a lower denture. You can't have both, so you can't eat. But oh, uh, we'll be generous. We'll give you a blender instead. Uh, and just to think that that is what we condemn people to live with every year, every month, every week. Um, it's not here. I, uh, I was on law for three years. I'm now an age of the system, and I'm now on a small pension. Uh, I couldn't do the law for challenge this year. I tried. But I've got health issues. By Wednesday, uh, I started filling up blood because I was eating the wrong things. Not that I wasn't eating enough, I was eating enough. But I've got a list of things that I'm not supposed to eat. And I had to eat it or go hungry. I was down to two meals a day. I would eat lunch and I would eat supper. I'm also a coffee holic. I drink about 10 cups of coffee a day. When you're using the same tea bag three or four times, it's just not the same. <laughs> My landlord this morning gave me a, a one pound bag of JJ Bean ground coffee. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, It's a crime. Personal welfare lives about 10 years less on average. I'm going to be politically incorrect. The government is attempt at murder. They are murdering people with policies. When you know that we are telling people 10 years before their time, that's murder. And I don't care which party it is, but they're you know. Our friends and our, our enemies gotta get off the ass and solve this problem. That's all I have to say. invited by a few friends to participate in this conference. <laughs> I did it two years ago. Um, and then 
was curious about the impact of it in dollars, $21 dollars that it was two years ago. And my, my friend Victoria, who um, invited the group of us to do this challenge, she said her, her theory is that people who live in uh, middle class lives, um, like the life I grew up in, they, they live a protected life that's insulated, they, they desire stability and security, and they do everything to protect that. And she said, that's not been my reality. Uh, she, she's lived a lot of her life on welfare. Uh, and she said, but those hardships and the hardships that I have experienced have inspired me to action. And so she invited us to take this challenge, because uh, it's just even just one week of hardship. She was asking that, that that glimpse of her life, of her hardship, would inspire us to action. And it has. Uh, because it's just, it, it is an all-consuming thing to live on welfare. And um, yeah, I found myself um, consumed with, obsessed with the idea of like what I was going to uh, ration for meals. We pulled out this food scale that we had in our cupboard that I'd never used before. But I wanted to like weigh everything to make sure that it would last because I'm a middle class person who's obsessed with security and stability and I just wanted to make sure I would still have food yesterday, which was the last day for me of the challenge. And it was just unrealistic. There was like no no mercy and no wiggle room. So one morning I ended up burning my oatmeal and I had to eat my burnt oatmeal because uh, the, uh, otherwise I would go hungry for the morning. Um, and it just felt so, um, the, the, this, the stress of having no wiggle room um, really compounded and, and affected the way that I was in friendships and in meetings that I attended that week. I found myself with very little energy and often just like zoning out and thinking about food instead. And um, I found myself daydreaming about today for when the challenge would be over. And I just realized that a week is not a really realistic amount of time for living on welfare. My friend of welfare did this week actually. And it, it made me understand a little more the um, kind of the, the binge cycle that I see some of my neighbors experiencing when they do get a welfare check because this, that's what I wanted to do today. I was thinking of all of the foods that I've missed and what I wanted to like splurge on and get so that I could eat it today when I was finished. <coughs> so it, it, it gave me a lot more empathy and a lot more respect for my neighbors who live this life every day. Good job. Um, and four and a half years of nutrition school and my belt shouldn't be too hard, right? By day two, I was craving sweets, 37 cents. <laughs> I came and went to the grocery store and I bought 40 grams of reasons. That's all that I could afford. Grocery stores used to be my safe haven. Not anymore. It was a reminder of inequalities. It was aisles and aisles of things I couldn't afford. Frustrating reminder. By day three, even if I start with the best of intentions, I was hangry. Hungry and hungry is what you call it. Impatient, frustratingly cold all the time. I don't know if you guys have shook my hand this morning, but I'm still on my challenge. My hands are still cold. Um, and all I could think of was food. Productivity lessened, my learning capacity not so great, and I was making up names for my colleagues because I couldn't remember them. I'm sorry. <laughs> and losing my words in the middle of sentences. Misplacing my valuables. By day three, I canceled all my plans outside of work and outside of the home. Even at home. I had to excuse myself from the dinner table and eat alone because I couldn't bear the thought of comparing my meal to my family's. Never where you turn. It's mouth-watering posters and ads. It's taunting. And food's everywhere except in your stomach. I day five, daily activity livings, daily living activities were difficult. Forget physical activity. Walking up the stairs hurt my quads. And I couldn't find my wallet, but I couldn't care to pay the bills. It's too much energy to get up out of bed and look for it. I was asleep by 8 p.m. And by day five, I cracked, stole a Snickers bar off the table. Felt like I stole it, but it was from my own house. And I was guilty. I felt disappointment, stress, and anxiety. And this is all just the tip of the iceberg, because it's less than a week. But for most people, it goes 
on indefinitely, and I can't imagine what that might feel like. For 30 years, uh, I have not done the welfare food challenge due to health problems, but I do do a challenge every week uh, to try and keep alive, because 30 years ago they basically say it's a death sentence. Um, but no, it isn't. I've also had a liver transplant uh, three and a half years ago, and now I'm dealing with cancer. Uh, so it is a challenge. It's every day I fight for life. I'm a fighter. I'm not a person who lays down and say, yeah, I'm just here. Um, it is a real challenge for people that are on welfare. They're trying to at least keep a roof over their head where they can pee in a regular toilet rather than one that is saved by 20 other people, or shared with 20 other people. Uh, SROs, as far as I'm concerned, are a health hazard. And I am blessed that I have a roof over my head, uh, where a lot of other people are having to be in SROs where cooking is not allowed. Things of that sort are really, really hard. Um, I have been told to drink two insurers a day. Well, that blows the budget right off the thing. I do some odd jobs on the side. I clean bathrooms. I've been told to put those on the back burner now. Um, so everything is going up in the air, and I have to try and shuffle things around. It is really hard for a person to go for a week-to-week -week challenge, even a lifetime challenge, of trying to keep alive. And poverty that is happening with our welfare system, which has not been raised or even indexed to the rate of inflation that hits every single person in this room is a crime of our governments. Our governments are supposed to work hand in hand for the goodness of the people, not the goodness of the corporations. Uh, we have to start getting the voice out that this is costing the healthcare system much more money than even helping the people on welfare. If you actually gave the basic needs to a person, that would be a better stepping stone than saying, oh, we don't have the budget for it. But when you have the budget to put 50000 in a pocket, that is blowing a budget. Uh, I am not, I am an activist, and I'll speak for others rather than just myself because I just keep on going. And I wish a lot of other politicians would be the activists that they need to be. And even if their own party is doing something that you do not agree with, speak out, step back, and hold your ground. Uh, things like that have to change the way things are done. Welfare rates and disability rates should be in debt, increased at least to above the poverty level now, and then indexed every three to seven years, rather than allowing us to fight almost a decade later, where we know inflation hits everyone. And Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Grace. <laughs> I speak. Well done. I'm going to be a bit extra because some, oh, yeah. some were short, but. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, no. Importantly, on us as a society. The issue is not just putting money into the hands of individuals for their benefit, but for our benefit as a society. I, I heard some, so there's been a great piece of work done over the cost of poverty in saying that it's upwards of $9 billion in British Columbia if when you start adding up you know, security costs and policing and health care and, and a whole range of, of costs, not to mention productivity, those of us that experience directly. And the cost of a sort of quite integrated, holistic, and supportive poverty reduction strategy would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $4 billion. So the, the business case is actually pretty good. But, but I'd like each of you now to focus on that next question of what are the broader social impacts, and, and I think this was meant uh, rhetorically, Bill, but uh, can people live on welfare rates? <laughs> it's, it's probably clearly no. Well, but the government thinks they can. <laughs> talk a little bit about, about those other broader social impacts and, and what this means to us. Can you go this way this time? Um, 
So I think something I noticed a few years ago was how um, privileged I am to live where I do. So I live in downtown East Side, and uh, we have a really rich community of survivors there. And I think, um, as I said, my respect for my neighbors grew a lot to during this challenge. Um, and one thing that I noticed is that the, the welfare rates, it just leaves such a gap, because you cannot, the, the government is saying you should be able to live on $18 a week, but you cannot live on $18 a week. And that is where these charities and these subsidized grocery stores have stepped in to fill this gap created by this policy from the government. And we're fortunate in downtown East Side that we do have access to these charities, but even that is being threatened as gentrification is really threatening our neighborhood. And I acknowledge that there's a lot of people who don't live near like a, a hub of, of services and um, options like I do. Uh, so I was able to buy a lot of produce at Sunrise, one of our favorite grocery stores in, in Chinatown, uh, that has really cheap produce. But I know people in rural communities, people living maybe more in suburb areas, because that is where um, the, the social housing was provided for them. They don't have the same access to to these amenities like I do. And so I think it's a much it's a much larger thing than just food. Um, and with the, the price this year going down to eighteen dollars, even in that budget if you see the breakdown, there is no money left for transit. So if you are not able to walk to a cheap grocery store, or like even where I live I couldn't find a place to buy bulk nearby. So I couldn't buy just a little bit of spices when I needed or just like a little more oatmeal when I needed some because I didn't like there, there's nowhere you can walk to to do that. So if you pay for a bus ticket in order to get cheaper food, and it's just like again the the compounding stress. Um, I developed a twitch in my elbow yesterday, <laughs> which is, is still going on today, and I, I I think that's from stress after just one week of like taking all of these factors in, and, and I just can't imagine how my health would suffer after doing this for a month or for a year or for multiple years, and um, the compounding stress is just um, so, so damaging to people's health. Yes. Okay, that's a nice question. I'm going to mostly talk about health. Um, one week, well, six days, I've already lost three pounds, and I'm not a big gal. Um, my mental process has slowed. Um, but I assure you, as soon as today's over, I'm going to be thinking about what to binge on. And that's what I think often does happen when welfare checks are distributed is a splurge, right? And um, food choices, probably as sweet and fatty as I can get, <laughs> cheesecake, chocolate chip cookies, whichever. Um, we know that with restricted dieting, our um, metabolism slows down. It's our body's way of trying to counteract the caloric deficit we've created. And if you ask me, the only difference between dieting and this challenge is that dieting is a choice, or in this it's not. Um, and if I were to splurge now, I, my body, physiologically, has created the optimal situation for easy weight gain. And um, let's not forget fatigue and lack of motivation. Forget the 30, 40 minutes of moderate, vigorous physical activity daily or seven to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables, source of protein on each plate, choosing whole grains, can't afford that, and two to three servings of dairy products, no way. We know that excess body weight, along with physical inactivity, predisposes heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and depression, among other chronic diseases. So not only does this lack of sufficient healthy food lead to specific nutrient deficiencies, but it also predisposes and incubates an environment for the development of chronic diseases. And according to the 2015 report on food costing in BC, published by the uh, Provincial Health Services Authority, the national nutritious food basket for a family of four is $975 in our pockets. And in Vancouver, the cost increases to $1,011. Per person, that's three and a half times more than what a person on welfare receives for food today. So if you ask me on welfare rates today, it's just not possible to be nourished and stay active. And food insecurity, it doesn't just affect the one person, it affects the community. We see reduced productivity, children find it harder to learn in schools, and they never reach their intellectual potential. 
We rob them of their future successes. And we find it harder to perform at work. Um, hunger's gnawing at our heads all the time. So how do we expect one to live in dignity and be a contributing member of society when food insecurity enables this kind of poverty trap? Okay, uh, first question is, can people live on welfare rate? Definitely not. Uh, how do they live? Uh, basically, they live by whatever means, and even if it is a form of crime, as we would see it, taking ketchup things from McDonald's or sugar from Starbucks, things that are laid out. Uh, some people come into Starbucks every now and then and get a glass of milk so they can get milk. Most of the Starbucks employees will say, okay, now you have your milk, go on. Our Starbucks allows that where I live, which is nice. Most Starbucks don't. Um, so people, when they get depressed and try to at least eat something, they try to put in sugar or smoke a joint, or do a drug <coughs> to take away that feeling that I'm hungry. And that causes a snowball effect of addictions, where people will start rolling, and then sometimes they'll just say, fuck everything, excuse my language. I give up, and they'll go on the street. And then they are out there asking for help, because they tried it with the ministry asking for help, and the ministry has not really helped them at all. They made them more depressed made them more involved in drugs, more involved in something to take that feeling of hunger away from them. When that happens, it's a crime from our governments to the ones that are in need of the basics of living, a roof over the head and food in your belly, and a few pennies in your pocket. Simple things, but with a complex outcome if it's not looked after properly. Um, what is the impact to our society? Our society, because a lot of it is sometimes run by corporations or rich people, looking at what else, um, the not in my backyard issue comes up a number of times when they try to do transitional housing for people slowly getting off the system. Many years ago, there was transitional housing for people getting off the streets. And I think there should be a transitional housing or some form of social housing that helps people get back into the workforce rather than... But it has to have a lot of avenues where it looks after the addiction that's been forced on them. And a lot of addictions are not, oh, I'm going to just party away. That happened in the 80s with HIV positive people, and I was one of those ones. I thought I'd be dead many years ago, and I'm still alive. A lot of people will understand things like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a contrary view. I actually think the problem isn't that people can live on it, it's that they can and survive on it, right? Um, and that's why the situation exists. Um, immoral, but possible, right? So, Lillian, your, your mistake was trying to eat healthily. Um, I ate more calories per day on the challenge than I normally do, but um, more than half of that was saturated fat because I knew I would need that to survive the lack of protein um, and other nutrients and minerals. Um, and that, has a long-term price, right? I mean, I, I live less time than most um, on the streets, you, you know, because it becomes a cycle that you can't get out of. Your mental focus is bad, um, you are getting sicker and sicker, it's harder and harder to get an education because you can't stay focused when you are there. Um, so I walked out of that with diabetes, digestive problems, a chronic degenerative disease, and you might think that's a long list. It's actually pretty short for somebody with my life history. Um, and yet for those who continue to eat this way, you know, that, that spiral just goes down and down and down. I had a coffee pot break on me. A coffee pot that was my only source of cooking of hot water to be able to make food in Ottawa. 
And I, I actually, like, I started crying. Not a little bit over the coffee pot, a lot over the past. If you think of the cost of that to society, to have somebody in that position, that they're so vulnerable and so desperate, um, opportunities to be able to move forward become pretty limited. So the impact on society, and um, Derek, you spoke to the cost of poverty, um, great report. The eight to nine billion that poverty cost is sort of equally split between healthcare and municipalities. So obviously as a city councilor, I have a very keen um, interest in, in this issue, even if, if I didn't have a sort of moral or ethical direction in that regard. Um, and that money is spent on emergency services, it's spent on police, we all know that, the criminalization of poverty, <coughs> that the you spoke to, um, moving people along, giving people tickets, issuing warrants, tracking them down. Um, it's also spent by fire, as the province has cut back on medical services, it's our firefighters who end up on the front line of um, whether it's diabetic coma or other emergency that people are experiencing. Um, but it's also spent in our school system, in our child care system, and I think that's what Derek, you keep trying to get us there. Um, it, it is immoral that we allow adults to live this way. It's actually criminal that we take that opportunity away from children. Because every impact I have um, on me from this week is compounded a hundredfold if I was in a position of, of having a growing body and not having that those calories and nutrients that I need. Um, you're robbing that child of their future, which which is should be a crime if it if it isn't a crime. Well, thank you. Thank you for that segue, uh, Andrea, because uh, I'm a teacher by training, uh, and I have enormous empathy, sympathy, and uh, for everybody who lives uh, in poverty and for uh, people on social assistance. But there's a particular place in my heart for the children who face that experience. And I want to talk about three impacts. And as Andrea said, when these children experience these things, they last a lifetime. Right? They, they have an impact on that particular human being all of their life. And uh, one is the lack of fresh fruit and vegetables. That was one of the hardest things for me to deal with. Like I had four bananas and two apples for the week. Um, and that's just like not enough and definitely not enough for a child who's growing. Cognitive function. Uh, about Thursday or Friday, um, I said something like, I don't think this is really experiencing my cognitive function. And a staff person who happens to be in the room at this moment, I'm not mentioning any names, Stephen, um, yeah. said, oh yes, it's in, it's in. <laughs> uh, But think of those children going to school, and we know this so well as teachers. We experience it all the time, uh, particularly, you know, I taught in two different schools on the east side of Vancouver, not for a long time, but I did teach at two different east side schools. And you, you see this impact on children and their ability to learn. Uh, it, it really, that's why we have breakfast programs, that's why we, you know, we have teachers who keep food in their room, because we know the impact uh, that this has on children and their cognitive function. And the third thing, and this was something I didn't really think about the first time I did the challenge, but I certainly did this time, is social isolation. So you think about the impact, uh, you know, it's part of our emotional well-being to socialize with our friends and family and to build those emotional relationships. And so when children are deprived of uh, the ability to do that because they can't go with their friends or, you know, they, they don't have the money to participate in this kind of social interaction with other children that builds those skills that last them a lifetime. And that's how we, we see the impact of poverty. Uh, and for those children, the impact will be on their educational outcomes, on their health outcomes, on their outcomes in the criminal justice system, on every aspect of their life. And, and that's really something we need to think about uh, because we need to make sure that children don't go up in poverty in this province. Thank you. Spencer. Um, I guess what I, uh, when I think about can people live like this, how do people survive, what are the impacts on the people living on social assistance or disability uh, or just on exceptionally low incomes. I also think about what are the impacts on the community, and I see it a lot in my community in the West End. Um, in the talk by Melanie Mark, uh, the MLA for Mount Pleasant, um, she certainly described the same thing, uh, is that it creates division. Uh, it creates incredible division between good people. Uh, I think that as a society, when one person is struggling, that does impact everybody. We're all connected, I believe that. And what I see in our community is you see people on the streets, 
begging for food. And you see the people who that makes uncomfortable for a variety of reasons. Uh, you see um, that leads to othering of people in poverty and this kind of, well, they're not like me and discrimination and um, sometimes violence. Uh, and then you see it as well where other people who are struggling in poverty, um, maybe on an inadequate minimum wage, sometimes get pitted against other people living in poverty and it becomes this kind of war. And I expected to see more uh, of that discussion come up from constituents, but what I was really struck by was the solidarity in the sense that people want to make change but um, are needlessly divided by a system that depends on making the rich richer and the poor poor. And I think that's the kind of society that we're in right now, unfortunately, and an economic, economic model that is absolutely busted, but is one which continues on dividing us and pitting us against each other, which leads to health problems, uh, criminal justice problems, which leads to social isolation. Um, I hear it from teachers, where the, you know, the kids that struggle. I hear it from the healthcare professionals. Like, it doesn't matter what part of our community, when I talk about these issues, people can understand it because they see people divided and falling out of the common community that we should all enjoy. Um, so clearly, uh, you can't get to community if there are people whose odds have, are so desperately stacked against them. You can't lead to prosperity if one part of your community is on the way down while the only the super rich are surviving. Um, so it, 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 yeah, it doesn't lead to unity. It leads to division and pain, um, envy, jealousy, anger, bitterness, um, which we shouldn't have in a society as rich as prosperous, um, and a society of justice that we all want to have. Thank you. Just while I've got you, I know you have to bug out early. How much longer do we have yet? I've got time. Okay, sorry, I was, I was going to poke you on the third question if we didn't have to make sure. Okay, let's go to Fraser and then we'll loop around. Yeah, I'm just trying to build and say that I absolutely agree with Andrea. You can't live on $18 a week. You can't. People have lived in far worse conditions. But we don't have to. I mean, people who lived in worse conditions were living in drought, were prisoners of war, they were put in concentration camps, and they survived. Most of some of them survived. But they didn't have a choice. Their governments didn't have a choice. I mean, drought came from famine. Here we're living in a province that brags we have the best economy in one of the richest countries in the world. And 180,000 people are living in extreme poverty. Whoa. <laughs> you know, we have a choice. And it's a political choice that most people are living in poverty. We've got a chance coming up at this point to change that. So let's do it. Welfare rates. But I think it's also really important for us to note that food is uh, poverty, when reframed as hunger, can be really challenging. And it's challenging because what we see happen, and what happened in BC in 1984, is the opening of food banks. Food banks as a response to hunger. So really important for us to, to not do that while we're having this conversation about food. Since 2008, we've seen the number of people that access food banks increase by 25%. Clearly, there, there, there's a solution that we need that isn't about necessarily about food. Um, so uh, my next question, I'm going to start with my MLA, Spencer, um, is around um, what should be done about welfare rates, and what are you going to do uh, to bring about change? Uh, what should be done about welfare rates? They should go up. What am I going to do about it? Um, work with my colleagues to bring forward a plan to do that. Um, that's very what? simple, but it sounds simple, but it's not. And I can look at the past previous <coughs> experiences, and this has been a lot easier to say than do. Um, I think beyond that, though, it's got to be encompassed in, in a wider poverty-fighting plan, uh, and I think that's got to include housing. 
so that we're going to actually build more affordable housing, low, lower income housing, because I know in talking to constituents, those that were in uh, low income supporting housing um, were much farther ahead than those struggling to find a rental or for, in an SRO or something like that uh, in terms of being able to live on the rates as inadequate as they are now. Um, we need to raise the minimum wage clearly. Um, we need to raise PWD as well. Um, but we also need to engage with those living this reality right now rather than an expert from the outside saying, this is the solution. Like me, I'm not an expert, I should say, but I mean, um, this, you know, one of the things that strikes me every month is when it's a long month, uh, 31 days, why isn't the budget much, you know, is higher than a 28 day month? Why is it that when you have an extra week, you get screwed and you have less food to eat. You know, it's completely inhumane uh, already in an human system. Um, when? Uh, well, I think for my constituents, uh, they would say yesterday, uh, 10 years ago. Um, when can I convince my colleagues to do it? Uh, we got the 34 other MLAs that I've got to bring on the side, and, and then a party of New Democrats who, uh, who say that the the fight we bring is about social justice and about fighting inequality and being a wider prosperity. Uh, that includes the poverty reduction plan, a law that we've introduced far too many times now uh, to count that the government has steadfastly refused to enact. So when, uh, May 10th, I would say, if we're successful, uh, we to make wider, wider, a wider push because in some communities, uh, the level of poor fashion is incredibly high. And we have to face that down. Uh, there's no question. Well, we may all agree. There are those in my constituency, very kind, caring people. When you talk social assistance, a wall goes up. And you have, we have to continue this kind of level of awareness raising, uh, but pointing out the costs of poverty if we're ever going to actually address poverty. Because for too many, they live a comfortable existence. And this threatens them, this conversation, uh, for whatever reason, whatever othering, whatever uh, discrimination that might be, uh, but also some of them are in real struggle and real poverty too, uh, working, and they're afraid if you take one thing from them, that's going to crumble their whole lives down as well. So it has to be about solidarity, I think, about this, the wider group of folks in our community uh, who are one paycheck away from homelessness. Uh, the 60% of people who ended up on the street uh, this year because uh, of poverty uh, who did have housing last year. Um, so it's, it's got to be a wider campaign, I think. And I really want to thank Race the Rates uh, and everybody who's continued to put pressure on us as elected leaders. Uh, because otherwise, uh, uh, there are many other louder voices out there, unfortunately, uh, demanding time uh, than the most marginalized and most vulnerable. So thank you for raising the voices um, and making it harder for them to be drowned out by others. Thank you, Spencer. I know you, as Derek mentioned, you've got to take off. So when you do, just um, just disappear. But before you do, I want to thank you for um, participating in the challenge, but also participating in animating this conversation about poor bashing and about the inadequacy of the welfare rates. And I think Bill and Trish, I don't know if you got that, but it looks like we've got a real champion around uh, facing the rates and around the poverty reduction strategy for BC. Okay, um, let's, uh, let's uh, go over and let's change this a little bit. We will talk with Lillian. I think if we want a healthy and productive province for ourselves and our future generations, it's crucial that we address the financial barriers to making healthy choices. So we need timely income and disability assistance reform so that more British Columbians can access healthy and nutritious foods to meet their nutritional needs. Raising the rates and making healthy food more affordable will make our healthcare system more effective. Take diabetes, for example. Right now I'm working at a diabetes clinic, so I keep referring back to it. Um, if not managed well, quality of life is affected. We have premature death, morbidity, and disability, as well as eye, neurological, kidney, cardiovascular complications. But in managing well, it requires many, many resources. Canada's public health agency estimates the cost of diabetes, not including the complications, to be $2.5 billion, and that was in 2000. Since then, prevalence has increased, and so have incurred costs. Reducing the prevalence of risk factors with diabetes would reduce the incidence of associated costs. So, in other words, it's preventable. In fact, the Canadian Diabetes Association states that with physical activity, 
regular physical activity in conjunction with healthy food and weight management, we can reduce the incidence by 60%. I argue that the financial constraints of depending on our current welfare rates, compounded by the rising cost of living, is a risk factor. It creates an environment that predisposes the lifestyle for the development of chronic diseases. And with that, I quote the Canada's Public Health Agency, it makes economic sense to invest in effective multifactorial strategies early in the course of the disease to improve health outcomes and reduce future health care costs. Food is a human right. Food is fuel. Food is also culture. And what we will do about the insecurity in our community today um, defines our community culture. We can no longer afford to turn a blind eye as our neighbors struggle against the physical and mental health effects of food insecurity. Uh, Andrea. So, I was thinking about this question. Um, I think, as frustrating as it is, especially immediately after a week of the challenge, um, I do think there's sort of an immediate, a medium, and a long-term phasing of, of action. I think the immediate, um, if we move to $600 for shelter on May 11th, let's say, or maybe after the cabinet sworn in, um, you would immediately double the dollars available for you, more than double, um, without even changing that side of it, right? You'd make a massive amount of difference for people um, immediately. I also, um, referencing back to that coffee pot experience, um, personally became very keenly um, anxious to get the SROs without cooking facilities converted in a way that they can, like, somehow give people access to cooking facilities that have just made a massive amount of difference. It makes a massive amount of difference in your access to more food, better calories. Medium term, um, once we get welfare at a rate that is survivable plus on, it has to be indexed um, not to inflation but to the cost of housing because that is the main pressure on anyone living in low income, whether it's welfare or minimum wage. Um, we also need to rethink the charitable food system. I think by far away the most shocking thing to me was how many people said to me, well, why wouldn't we just go to a food bank? Why wouldn't we just, I'll give you food, I'll, like, you know, food is so important to us that we'll starve people on welfare, but not important enough to us that we'll just, like, hand it out freely, right? And the worst moment for me was sitting, um, and the entire week was not actually the coffee pot, it was sitting in a bench at Vancouver board meeting yesterday. Uh, everybody, except for me, had just eaten a very a free, taxpayer-funded, uh, high-calorie, very high-protein meat, like three different kinds of meat and eggs, and it smelled really good. Um, and then proceeded to talk about why we should give tax, why we should lobby to give tax cuts to corporations so that they could donate more wasted food um, to charity. And I just, it was pretty tough not to jump up and say something um, that. But I do think it really struck home for me how much the fact that we can survive on saturated fat um, and this charitable food system is masking the reality of how desperate it is for people on welfare, and we have to go after that. Um, the next thing is long term. I'm a big proponent of guaranteed annual income. I just think, I think it's up to me and others to think about how we get the poor bash from people from poor bashing to believing that that is not only possible but necessary. Um, and the last thing I'll say is a complete housing system overhaul. As long as housing is treated as a commodity, as only a commodity and not a right, um, we will. We'll be back. We might be able to get the welfare rates up and all the other things, and then we'll be back here 10 or 15 years from now having exactly the same discussion. If it's a monopoly board, you need capital to get on. For those of us who don't have capital, it's not that we're not losing. We're not losing the game. We're not even playing. We, we are desperately hoping that the people on the board um, even notice us. And I just don't think that that is going to, it, it's not sustainable for the long term. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, I think we can address this uh, on two levels, personally and on a societal level, because you have to remember that it's people who make the policies that impact societies. And so, for me to take this, for me as a person with very little political sway um, or political power, for me to take this challenge 
um, had uh, it, it, sh it changed the way that I um, view poverty. It changed the relationships that I have with people who experience poverty. And I'm glad that poor bashing has been talked about because um, if we can counter that individually, and if we can counter that um, so that we see all of society saying that poor bashing is not okay, that policymakers will no longer bring poor bashing into policy, um, then we can then our then our policies can begin to be liberated and to be working on behalf of people who do experience poverty. Um, and so how I did this was just acknowledging my privilege that even throughout the challenge, even this week where I was limited to eighteen dollars for food, I still had privilege that I could leverage in my favor. So I, I had a community of people that I lived with that was doing this challenge together so we could share food, we could barter together. I traded my roommate uh, some oil that I had purchased for her potato skins. <laughs> because people pay like eight bucks for that at Boston Pizza. <laughs> um, and we also, I have like access, like I said, to, to affordable groceries in my neighborhood. And I have the, the knowledge and appliances in my kitchen to know how to like process tomatoes a bunch of different ways and freeze them before they go bad. Because that's the one downfall of, of cheap food is that it's like on the verge of going bad. Um, so all of these things are things that I have access to because I'm a person of privilege. That people, like Andrew Reimer said, people living in SROs do not have the same access to the kitchen amenities that I have, and not necessarily the same access to to community um, and to, to people to share resources and share food. But although I've seen a lot of rich uh, rich community among people who experience poverty. Um, and so if, I think on a, on a more political level, what we need to do is commit to creating a, a poverty reduction plan. Um, SBC is the only province without one now. And I moved here recently from Saskatchewan, and Saskatchewan, it was about two or three years ago when I, when I moved, and they had just uh, won the poverty reduction plan. And then to move to BC, which in many ways is ahead of Saskatchewan in, in many trend-setting things, um, but to find out that we're still behind on this issue uh, is just really sad. And it doesn't make sense because it doesn't have to be. So I think that if we have a provincial a plan to be talking about poverty, um, then we can't just be putting this issue on the back burner. We can't be saying, like, oh yeah, people are people are surviving. I think. Um, I think it's true that people are surviving on on welfare rates, and therefore policymakers feel like they can turn a blind eye to it because it, they're making a go of it. So let's focus our attention on on other things. So if we have a policy where we're talking about how do we reduce poverty all the time, um, then that can no longer be put on the back burner. Okay. Um. I'll speak on three levels of governance. Uh, one, the welfare rate should be raised, and then it should be indexed at least to a percentage of the inflation that hits all of us. Uh, I'm not saying to the percentage, but to a percentage to keep us above the poverty line. Um, and uh, it should be more humane because the system has become more unhumane because if, if you pick up a phone to try and get the answers now which you're on for hours and then they'll say leave your message and we'll try and call you back you don't get called back half the time or you try and do it through the computer half the time you don't even get a proper answer that way the best way of doing the system is actually talking to a person rather than an electrical device to try and get your the way things are going when you're applying for services. That has made trying to even apply for services extremely hard and wrenching on a person who is actually trying to live. Um, the uh, city issue would be with civics would be give more incentive for rental and different forms of permits for buildings rather than ownership buildings. There has to be more broader types of housing than we have thought. Co-ops are being axed out of subsidies by the federal CMHC and after 35 years of people living in a co-op, it's axed. 
if they had a subsidy. And a lot of families lived in co-ops to at least be able to afford living. Uh, things like that have been thrown away. Uh, <laughs> so federal funding for services for the people uh, like PWA Vancouver, PWA, uh, things like that have been chopped this year. A lot of people are going to feel the pinch that some workers aren't being able to do the service that they're able to do for the ones they're supposed to serve. The poor ones, the ones with medical problems, the ones dealing with issues that are much broader than just being poor, trying to live. Uh, and so a number of all governments have to start holding their hands together and actually working for the solution rather than saying, the puck is on your area, deal with it. Uh, it's not that type of thing. You have to work together rather than apart. Um, because every government, if the federal government access more of the social systems funding, that will affect a, a number of people. If the civics do not want to do rental housing or different forms of housing, that will put people into a more harder situation. And coming next year, we have an election. We have to speak out for the ones that need to be able to vote. In the federal election, trying to get people to vote that are living in SROs is like pulling teeth. They have to fill out a form if they've lost their ID. Uh, they do not have what's called a residency. Most SROs are considered only a hotel residence, and they do not allow them to vote. Things like that have to change. We have to get machines out to people soon enough so they can vote and say, we need the people to vote, even the poor people. And they've been put on the back burner too many times. Thank you very much, Fraser. I probably spoke over here. You know, you wouldn't believe that Fraser was pinch-hitting today. Uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that one of our panelists uh, couldn't participate, someone uh, who lives on welfare each and every day, and felt that they just didn't have the energy today to participate in this panel. So I really wanted to acknowledge that, because that's the reality for folks. But also, thank you, Fraser, for, for stepping in. We wouldn't think they were pinch-hitting here. Thank you. Um, Irene. Yes, well, I'll join the call for a poverty reduction strategy. I, I think that's what we need. Uh, no question we need that. Um, and it has to have a raise in welfare rates or a guaranteed in annual income. I'm kind of a fan of that idea, but some way to raise the bar for people uh, who need that support. Uh, and, you know, do it with dignity, uh, which, is, which is not happening right now. It has to include a social housing plan, um, and uh, I think the federal government has a role to play in that, but the provincial government has to step up as well. Um, I will say there are 500,000 people in this province who work for less than $15 an hour, and so we have a huge problem of poverty wages. Uh, many of those people struggle with some of the same challenges because they aren't working full time. Uh, so uh, some of them are, you know, earning above uh, the welfare rates, but not by that much. And still, if you work full time on 1085, you're $5,500 below the poverty line. So we need a $15 minimum wage. That has to be part of our strategy around poverty. Uh, the $10 a day child care plan is also assistance to low income families. And so I think that's an important aspect of a plan. Um, these are all things that will help people who are struggling and living in poverty. I think um, these kinds of issues and these, I mean, I think we have to be absolutely clear. These are choices governments make. Uh, governing is about making choices. We are here because the Christie Clark government has chosen to put us here and has chosen to not have a poverty reduction strategy, has chosen to freeze welfare rates for nine years. This will define our choices next May. And, and we need to push the NDP, no question about that, to put some of these things in their platform to make commitments to us. But we also need to work with them because uh, we know that we will be better off with a government that cares about people, that has some compassion, that will put a poverty reduction strategy uh, in place. And that's what we need to do. We will be working on that uh, as hard as we can uh, in the months to come. 
Thank you, Larry. First of all, uh, somebody in the audience that I want to congratulate. You can hear him heckling. He took his first steps yesterday. <laughs> so, we're going to hell. <laughs> you know, uh, what really touched me when I was reading Andrew's blog was when the coffee pot broke. I work with people who live in SROs, and I, I live in an SRO. Most SROs don't even have a place where you can cook. So if you go to the food bank, you can't even cook half the food that they're going to give you. So you depend on that coffee pot to cook your pasta, your, your, your three-minute egg, you will take you a half an hour to cook. And there's no reason for that. You know, there, there is absolutely no reason for it. And when you go to welfare, and they tell you to go to the food bank, yeah. this, is this is policy. You go to the food bank. You go for it, you say you get a job because you need clothes. Go to the Salvation Army. You used to be able to get uh, $110, I think it was. Yeah. You can't do that anymore. People on welfare are actually the lucky ones. Because we can't go to a loop bank. We can't spend an hour in line for free food. If you're working for 10 bucks an hour, you can't. So people on welfare are actually the lucky ones. <laughs> and that doesn't make sense to you. Tangible uh, examples there, the, the very least of which is voting, assuming you can sign up for vote, which can be all that kind of stuff. Um, to, to move to the next phase, I'm, I'm hopeful we can we can coax the, the quiet and docile Bill Hopwood <laughs> into sharing thoughts about what we can do and, and why we can do it. Uh, and as another another plug, um, while I've got you, at Mary Claire's suggestion, she said, you know, one interesting idea might be to take what I would have spent on food this week and invest it in the work of Raise the Rates. It was a great idea. And so we've created uh, an online giving portal through our foundation, uh, our collaboration with BC Poverty Reduction Coalition that we can go to now and and make a contribution, and, and we had a great conversation about that uh, among a number of, of advocacy groups about not propagating the charity mentality and doing so, but but actually to look at that as an investment and, and think about that as, as Bill shares his remarks, and, and he'll undoubtedly prove the value of such an investment as he has for me many times um, in that voice that we need to have collectively and powerfully. So Bill, for that introduction. Is this working? Okay. Um, first of all, thanks to all the Raise Rates members and supporters. And others that happen without a great team of people. Thanks to all the people who took the challenge. Um, I'll email you this, Spencer. <laughs> I know you will though. <laughs> well, we're drawing up this year. Because of the soaring rents, originally it was going to be $13 for food. But what we did is we took buses, transit, out of the equation. In other words, did what reality does. You can't afford to buy a bus ticket if that's a day's food. And yet if you get caught, you get a $173 fine. And we know of people who have thousands of dollars in unpaid fines because they don't get enough money in welfare to buy a bus ticket, and you can't get on the Met Sky Train now because they put those ridiculous waste of money barriers that they're never going to get the money back from. That's a different story. But you know, we took the bus tickets out, which is part of reality. We were concerned, even at eighteen dollars, that it was going to be hard to get people to do this, and something's happening because more people have taken it. There's over two hundred this year, 
in every part of British Columbia. And again, welfare and poverty is not the downtown east side. The vast majority of people do not live in the downtown east side. In fact, they don't live in Vancouver. They live all over this province. We've got lots of coverage in mainstream and social media. And the people who did the challenge did it to raise awareness and to bring change, and we and you are having an impact. I like sort of to continue first the practical point is go to the part of the Welfare Food Challenge website entitled Take Action and write to your MLAs, move a resolution through your faith group or your union local, write a letter to the editor to keep the momentum going. We're also, this is Raise the Rates, are starting a new exciting art project of which that is one of the first products. It's entitled We Can't Afford Poverty. And there's these small posters and buttons outside. There's more, more to come, videos, lots of stuff. So go to the website, which is nopovertybc.ca, and sign on there, and you'll get loads of information. Or go talk to the people on the table outside. I will make two points of the discussion. One, people are describing the effect of living on this money. People on 610, on welfare, are expected to go to work. Imagine it's a five-week month. You get the same rent check. You get an interview. Do you eat that day? Do you get a haircut that day? Or do you get some clean clothes? Or do you go in the physical state you are in? You know? And that's the reality. People have to get a job. And the government does everything possible to keep people from not getting jobs. Welfare now does not help people. It is a punishment for being poor, and it's to scare the Jesus out of working people not to fall off the job, put up with every crap job you've got, because that's what happens if you don't. And the second point I want to take up is privilege. Going to work and getting paid is not a privilege. Being a multi-millionaire is a privilege. And neoliberalism is pushing us so far back that we think having a decent job and having a roof on our head is a privilege. They are not privileges. Those are human rights. And people on welfare don't have even those human rights. I, the privilege to me are the 1%. And that's the cause of why we have this. We know it is people and movements that make change. And it's up to us to push, both to push other politicians and to support politicians like what Spencer said. But movements make change rather than politicians. We have to make that movement. We are building that movement. And part of having a strong movement is a clear vision of what we want. And I want to pose a question even to some of the panel and the people who've taken the challenge. Do we want to end something bad? Or do we want to make it just a little bit worse? Not quite so bad. You know all the arguments about welfare. This week, the city of Vancouver had a proclamation for the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. Eradication of poverty, not the International Day for a slight reduction in poverty. <laughs> what is poverty in BC? The poverty line for an individual person is $1,500 a month. That's what welfare should be. And anything less is accepting poverty. For people with disability, it should be $1,800 a month because they have additional costs. I know that even some of our supporters, and even maybe some of the people on this panel, think I'm being unreasonable. It's such a huge increase from 610 to 1500. It's unrealistic. Most movements started unrealistic. Women having the vote? How absurd. Workers having a weekend, it'll destroy the economy, and so on. Our movements always start unrealistic until they become real. It is not our job to decide how deep the poverty in BC is, or how many people stay in poverty. Our job is to argue that nobody should be in poverty. Nobody mentioned the tax cuts, none of my panelists. I'm going to tell you. This government gives, gave, gives away 3 
$50 billion every year to the rich and the corporations in tax cuts. The average person in the 1% got a tax cut handout and it comes every year $41,000 tax cut. That's more than the average wage in British Columbia. There is plenty of money to raise welfare and to fund education and childcare and other needs if we have a government that actually wants to care about the 99% rather than the 1%. I don't know how anybody can make a vote that decides that people will stay in poverty. I don't know how they can live with their conscience. But I don't have that vote. Our job is to build this movement as powerful and as strong as we can make it to end poverty in BC so that all people in BC live in dignity. Thank you.
quite prepared to say they're good, but um, <laughs> not bad people, who have zero lived experience, none, and know nobody who does, and know nobody who knows anyone who does, right? And this is how that 1% or 10% kind of keep their powers, because that's, that's they support each other in it. So my, my summary point was around how do you get, like, the other thing that came to me was all the triggers, right? I, you, crying about, um, you know, getting emotional about it. I've had an equal number of people come up to me like that, people who live in desperate poverty who have been triggered by this whole experience. So how do I empower those people who, and I'm one of them, like really just don't want to go back there. Like, I mean, metaphorically, don't want to dive into a campaign to raise the rates because it's so traumatic to experience it again. So how do we get that group who has experienced it, of good people, to be that political force? Because it's not reasonable to ask the people who are living without the calories or the protein or the you know the money who, who are trying to access the food system to be the bulk of that movement. So that it's a reflection, not a very focused one, I apologize, um, about how we could make change happen this election. It is the mothers, the grandparents, the people who've lived in poverty, um, bringing together their social networks and getting them engaged, that's going to add the bodies we need for this to be a credible threat to the government and the election. What kinds of responses when people find out you're doing a welfare challenge? Well, there's many, but two of them are one that Andrea talked about. It triggers memories of people, and I had that experience the last time I did it, but many of the people that I've worked with uh, have experienced poverty at some time in their life, and, and the fact that you're doing this brings that to them. But a very typical middle class response is, oh, you'll lose weight. <laughs> and, and it's kind of interesting that our relationship with food, those of us who have enough, is around our body image, which is another whole uh, ball of wax. But, but the fact is, I have a niece who's now a doctor, and she did a lot of work in Peru on the relationship between poverty and obesity. Uh, because the fact is that you don't really lose weight when you live in poverty. I mean, I guess at some extreme end, maybe you do. But if you have money to spend, and we have talked about this too, you spend that money on unhealthy things, right? Things that are high in calories, high in fat, and cheap. And it, it always amazes me when I go to shop on this welfare challenge, how processed foods are cheaper than natural foods. Like, what's that about? You know, mac and cheese and the noodle soups, which I ate plenty of this week. Um, and so I, I think that there are lots of um, misconceptions about poverty. Uh, and, um, and, and actually, one of the benefits of doing the welfare challenge is that it really forces you to think about those things and learn about those things. Uh, you can't reproduce the experience completely, but you do learn some of those things. Hello, uh, my name is Vanessa. Um, I was born, raised, and it's been going lately. We're on the other side, just being plain mean, being mean, mean spirit. And sometimes it's, it can be both at the same time. Um, and at my most magnanimous moments, I, I try to sort of err on this side that, okay, no life experience here. Uh, perhaps that's what it is. Uh, that's what it is. And, Trina may have heard me tell this story before, before I, but before I get to my experience this week, I, I did do the challenge, I, I made it through to the end, and I, I did sort of guiltily kind of sense a bit of competition about it. I once thought I was a bit clever because I discovered the, uh, the grocer near my house that had this little bench where they had the one dollar bag of remainder vegetables, and so I would take that home and cut off the mushy bit of the cucumber, or discard the bruised um, pork portion of the apple and then still make a fairly um, nutritionally, nutritionally balanced meal and live off the chili I made last Sunday and see how many days I can stretch it. Um, but by about Thursday, even though I was feeling physically fine, I had to apologize to our <coughs> executive director at the BCTF the following day because I know that she and I had an hour-long conversation about our executive committee meeting that I was chairing and running the show and everything as it were. But the next morning, I just went up to her and said, I cannot remember a single thing we discussed. Can we have that conversation again? I felt the, the uh, cognitive impairment that Irene noticed. And some of that um, probably was, was symptomatic, too, of the fact that my schedule got thrown off as well. 
like the previous week or so. The meal I thought I was going to have and the thinking about food didn't happen until three, four hours later when I finally got home later than that planned. But um, I have been thinking a lot about the students that we teach in British Columbia, given that one in five are living below the poverty line and what that does to their learning when they're hungry all day. Um, and perhaps trying to figure out the themes of the latest book that they're studying in their literature course, literature course in secondary school, or just uh, you know, making it through the ABCs in the primary program, might not be top of mind when their stomach is growling. And about two years ago, we had a minister of education by the name of Peter Fassbender, and the ECTF had commissioned a um, member of survey of experiences with child poverty in the classroom. And we have amazing researchers on staff at BCTF that take that qualitative and quantitative data and, and translate it into a way that's quite effective in speaking to the media and presenting great things to politicians. And so we had our senior researcher present that information um, to Minister Fassbender. But by about eight minutes in of sharing some of that information for what was supposed to be a half hour presentation, he clearly was not engaged with the topic. And you know, I won't. I can't I can only speculate to assume either he was bored or he was miffed by some of the information that was uh, being brought forward and, and teachers' experiences in the classroom um, with these students and what we observed to be the effect on those students' learning. Um, and instead, he cut things off and, and piped up and started talking about the corn roasts that he would do as the mayor of Langley every Sunday and the, uh, the pancake breakfast that he would throw on. Uh, how that was his contribution to his community to turn the situation around. And uh, he, um, he saw fit to tell us a story of encountering a mother with three children in a 7-Eleven when he was pumping gas um, into his mini um, one day, and how the two children, one of whom was in a stroller, was pulling their mother's pant leg, going, Mom, Mom, can we have this candy bar? Can we have this candy bar? And, and she turned to the children and said, No, I'm buying this lottery ticket. That's what I'm doing with this money. Um, and we were a bit at a loss to try to figure out why he was telling the story. And then he went on to sort of do this big thing about personal choice and all this sort of libertarian, you know, people just made wide choices and wise choices. We wouldn't have this poverty problem in British Columbia. And afterwards, after he left, we just went, we, we said a few words that I'm not going to say on camera here. Um, but if this is the, the sort of view of the policymakers um, in the province, that if it was if it wasn't for these one or two poor choices that um, parents might make along the way, that all the child poverty and poverty in this province would go away. It has nothing to do with systemic issues. It has nothing to do with welfare rates or the lack of opportunities in British Columbia or a crummy minimum wage or anything like that. If that's truly what um, Mr. Fassbender and his ilk uh, truly think and feel, um, then we're in a lot of trouble in British Columbia and so are the kids. So I'm, I'm very happy that this event occurred this uh, this week to uh, to bring broader attention to the need to dramatically increase the welfare rates in British Columbia as well as the minimum wage. And um, it's all going to do that that happens. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Ian Marquis. And, uh, uh, wow, I'm shaky. <laughs> I've been on the, the challenge too this week, and um, I just wanted to um, <coughs> mention something about an, an interesting thing that happened in our household was that my partner, who was not on the, the challenge this week, also crashed with me. And um, it brought up the issue that um, Irene spoke to about you know, the importance of uh, the, the social importance of food, you know, connection to community, and, and really that class privilege. Anyways, you know, our, our, um, our familiar, familial patterns of, of cooking and eating and sharing food together were completely thrown off. And she crashed with me, and uh, she's a teacher, and she actually has had to book time off of work because she is just uh, seriously you know, feeling crappy. Anyway, um, I also uh, want to really, I want to thank Bill and, and the Raise the Rates campaign. It, it's really an important campaign because well, I work as a neighbor, I work in, uh, in the area of uh, food security. I work as a community developer for a neighborhood food network. And, um, you know, a lot of the programming that we do is about food access and um, supporting families who are struggling and 
I think a lot of us in the networks right now are struggling to understand our work and to um, and in the, and the realization that it's not enough that uh, we need to attack the underlying causes of, of the cause of, of, food, of food insecurity. And you know, as we talked about today, you know, it's really about poverty. And so, food kind of—I mean, it's it's a, it's a, it's a consequence of poverty. And it's not well understood um, by policymakers. Uh, it doesn't clearly fit in. Is it a health issue? Is it a social policy issue? Is it uh, you know we have the educational um, ministry supporting food security through the school system to some extent. Uh, it, it's it's kind of a muddy area. And the race the race this this campaign does kind of bring the, this issue of food security to light. And uh, so again, just trying to understand you know, the role um, of us working at the grassroots and how we can support policy change and, and awareness raising. And certainly, I think for us to work with Race the Rates and other groups that are doing anti-poverty work is, is really key. And as well as um, I'm thinking, um, because we work with, with people in the community who are struggling, and we know them personally, uh, we know their stories, and we hear their stories, and we've heard amazing stories today that, that are very impactful, and, and I, I think it's important for us to bring these stories forward in, in some way, and, and, and in the way that Raise the Rates is doing, and through their campaign, we can't afford poverty, I think are exceptional examples of ways in which we can help support this movement and I'm really pleased to be part of the movement and, and thank you again Bill. Thank you. I just want to address briefly this thing about how we make food. I think most people in British Columbia at some point in their life have spent time in poverty. A lot more than you know it's generally seen and then these stories all come out. And, and if you include family and friends, it touches most people. And then if you include most workers are two paychecks away from poverty. So the majority of people in BC are, are poverty matters to most people. The problem is that we haven't done a good enough job in the last few years of making those connections and sort of po welfare is put off in a little ghetto. And I think that's partly what Raise Rates is trying to do, is get it out of that ghetto. But also, I mean, I'm extremely optimistic that we're going to win. I don't know when, but we're going to win. Consistently, opinion polls put 75% or more British Columbians want a program to end poverty. Consistently. Um, we are winning the public argument, even just little things like the first year we did the welfare food challenge, the people who had to manage our Facebook constantly were taking down hate mail. You know, there's been very little hate hating, not just an hour, but on most of your Facebook pages, most of your postings, wherever you've been doing them. You know, the haters don't have the confidence they used to because we're winning the public argument. And I think the challenge itself is really great because it's. It's person to person, friend to friend, work colleague to work colleague, and it brings up all sorts of discussions. So I, I'm not really interested in the motive for po motivation of politicians, whether they're good, bad, ignorant, kind or not. I just care they're going to do something. And our job is not really to worry about their motives. Our job is to make it so they have no choice but to move. Those who want to move, we encourage, and those who don't want to move, we encourage to go away. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. So just after four now, so I, I think we're going to wrap up, but I want to thank everyone deeply in terms of the participation from the, the panel here who came and brought their best game and, and thoughtful contributions and the folks in the audience, of the, the 200 plus that took the challenge and the, the countless others that have joined in solidarity, I, I think. Uh, I totally agree that, that we're, we're on to something. My biggest concern, to be honest, is that there's a, a sort of notional change. Mm. We'll bump it up a bit and yes. feel really good about it. 
and, and gain a ton of political mileage out of it. And I don't think we can stand for that. I, I think that it's, what's really incumbent on us is to make sure that it's loud enough that the response is not just no service. So, so we've got a bit of a window here. There are going to be a whole number of folks running for office. And the extent to which this becomes an election issue, a deeply political issue, will be the indicator of our success. The long-term indicator is raising the rates and eliminating poverty. But I think this has been a great kickoff for me on a personal level. And I hope for us as organizations and individuals to, to get together and, and raise the rates. Um, so thank you. Just, just keep the conversations going. Keep the conversations going. There's a policy piece that we all recognize needs to happen, but also the, the, the conversations need to happen because we need to convince more people and have those conversations to challenge for that. And for those now that are that are can hang around and have a chance to come up and look at the amazing graphic facilitation that's happened up here, maybe uh, we're going to have someone up there that will try to take a picture of us. So come up and I encourage you to come up and have a look and we'll gather. Particularly all the people who did the challenge. It'd be great to have a photograph of all the people who yep. did the welfare food challenge. So please. Okay, posters and buttons at the outside there too. Take them, spread them around if you need more, let them know.